Welcome to the June 20th Beehive Production User Call. We have Victor, Andrew, Hans, Patrick, Jan, B, and myself, Michael. And I wanted to put in a quotation that I have uh, found quite timely, yet timeless, uh, from Theodore Rett, which was, Linux people do what they do because they hate Microsoft. We do what we do because we love Unix. And I wanted to look that up for Victor. Welcome, Victor. This is your first call. Thank you, Patrick, for inviting Victor. Would you like to tell us about yourself? Sure. So... I'm based out of Canada, uh, in the Alberta area, which is kind of central Canada, a little bit to the west. Um, I got into the BSD world when, interestingly, Google Photos started to charge to upload photos. And so I thought, well, I'm going to... And I, I take care of the networking and technical side for a community here. We're about 100 people. And so I run multiple different things. And, but yeah, I got into it with TrueNez and started building some scripts uh, after I found some scripts, specifically Nextcloud and whatnot else on the TrueNez forums. And that just got me started. And I've developed pretty much a passion for the BSD world, um, as Patrick knows from the forums. And so it's been four to five years that I've been in this world. And yeah, I'm just willing to learn more and, and just help out more. Well, welcome. And I hope someone will jump in who's been building TrueNAS, but we can talk about that uh, out, out of band. So let's see. Uh, welcome, Hans. And Hans has kindly drafted a proposal that need not yet be public, I wanna review it, but it is for TPM emulation. Uh, Beckhoff, the automation company who's been working on GPU pass-through has produced TPM pass-through so that a single workstation can have the TPM chip get passed through to Windows, but that's not helpful if you want to say virtualize a dozen Windows 11 or possibly future fut uh, server products that depend on a TPM. So thinking out loud, uh, uh, Oxide is a Lumos based. And oh, one quick point of order, Victor, we try to give equal time to Illumos and FreeBSD. It's often a little FreeBSD heavy, but Andrew's working on Illumos. Hans is out of a Illumos background and, and Antrenig who might join has a, a fondness for it. And I've always been fond of it. So it, it's all fair game. Uh, so Beckhoff did that work and might be interested up uh, Patrick, would your comp I know on a certain the public record will show that on a an enterprise working group call you you voiced the need for TPM emulation and pass through. Is that something your company might be interested in funding? I I honestly don't think so because okay. this no is not in any way our core business. Okay, no worries. I just I just need to provision a single or two Windows eleven VM for colleagues to use that's and, and that's that once once windows 10 is, is end of life we don't mm -hmm. use windows for anything productive we just have these two windows servers which run our active directory mm -hmm. on beehive okay and when people want to change their password they use rdp to log into a single windows desktop system that we also run in beehive hit control I'll delete click on change password and change their password right and cool. that's the the only thing we use a Windows VM for. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. No sorry worry. about that. And I'm already investigating Proxmox as a virtualization platform in combination with TrueNAS, of course, as a form of backup and storage. So what inspired your comment on needing TPM handling? The necessity to be able to run Windows 11 if we want to be in any way competitive in the marketplace. I mean, what, what okay. do people use hypervisors for? Part one, hosting on a large scale. Part two, run Windows on a non-Windows platform because you need it for your tax returns or right. yeah. that, that single Grimm's electronic dictionary app that I have that runs only on Windows or whatever it is. Yep, 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 you are correct. And I'm helping a company just virtualize all their old machines and everything gets imaged. And just yeah. this week, I I had to admit defeat. I couldn't quite get a Windows 7 machine to convert to UEFI, but it worked under QEMU, under FreeBSD. So 
that's just fine. I had VNC within a few minutes and off it goes. So cool. That one Windows app, and I totally know what you mean. Okay, so on... And to Jan's point, uh, yes, please. Oh, uh, nothing platform. productive, nothing productive, just games. Actually, a lot of that's going to Linux now, thanks to Valve. Ah, yes. Uh, Jan, uh, Jan, uh, just games. <laughs> but uh, Andrew points out. That valve um, is making part of it. Okay. Yes, Jan. I didn't want to derail it, but uh, for those uh, keeping track, at least a few months ago when I last tested, it was possible to use uh, Linux Steam uh, on FreeBSD without a hypervisor, just the Linux uh, ABI kernel module. Um, really? Nice. So uh, Proton worked. I managed to spin up Witcher 3 and it when with vsync enabled so and 60 fps so what more to ask for well happy oh, fragging FPS screen. Cool. cool 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 um but, yeah that's a topic we should find a place for but this is not it right now until we get to these fun things so let's see reload 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 uh the current today's VM image and binaries, which are probably being built as we speak, should include the 9P client. And uh, some of you may recall me fundraising years ago for the 9P server to be cleaned up in Beehive. Well, oh, based on a whole bunch of behind the scenes conversations and coding and Juniper being a bit inaccessible thanks to an acquisition, et cetera, this has finally landed, and I am quite excited. Um, there will be discussions of like, oh, vert.ofs is better. Oh, NFS is better. Oh, all that. But once people see that they can boot a VM with uh, only file level access rather than a block device, I think people will start appreciating the broader topic. Um, I don't okay. yet know if one could do like a dash E when in the beehive string and do it purely with zero block device, or if you need a minimum device that would just at least have, I don't know, an FS tab, et cetera. Any thoughts or questions there? Jan, you pointed out you'd love to have a vert IO VSOC. Tell us more about that. Later. OK. <laughs> OK. So the, the 9P Hans, protocol yes. is, is the 9P protocol has settled in, in a way right. that it can be used productively and then this is stable and everything. Uh, I only remember it not so favorably from the Corel days. Uh, they were uh, a bit, they were missing some key bits and yes, you could lose data. Doug himself is using it for kernel development where if you need disposable machines to quickly go through, um, okay. there is a that, way. That sounds exciting because everything is probably better than NFS. Uh, mm, yeah, not a file <laughs> system, nearly a file system. I'm sure everyone has their own. Nightmare file system, Nightmare. Ooh, that's file security. Yes, <laughs> they're the new oh, one. Come okay. on, that's from the Unix haters handbook. That's decades yeah. old. It's, a, it's a, That's a fantastic book. I'll, yes. I'll link it. It's, okay. it's yes, great. Drop it in there. Not a, uh, nearly... it's, it's got reprinted. Oh, uh, really? I just, yep. Okay, so, um, and it does raise the question of, with all the oh. Python madness, uh, is Ganesha NFS back on FreeBSD? It has a 9P server. Should one need something fancier than the built-in um, one? Yes. That doesn't help you. Okay. Because the, their 9P server is 9P over TCP, ah. not over VIDIO. So it's uh, I'll, I'll what do makes that. it special have, is that you're not video. going over the network with uh, VIDIO 9PFS ah. and the in kernel support for it. What instead happens is that it's basically a virtual PCI device which speaks the 9P file system. So there's no networking involved in. Hmm. Uh, then ZIO and 9PFS. Cool. So, which means that the only configuration you need is the name of the file system. So, Jan, based on what Doug has written, can you tell us what a VM might 
need? He's a little vague on like, gee, which of these um, are so yeah, we what you guess? need is uh, it says it's basically there. So once you're at the uh, you have a kernel loaded, you need uh, the, the kernel needs to know where to boot from. Um, looks like that's all it needs. I don't know for certain if uh, the UEFI uh, boot ROM supports 9P. If it does, you should be able to load the bootloader from it. If not, you need the uh, basically slash boot on a block device. So that you have a bootloader and uh, a kernel and kernel modules. Unless you want to compile a custom kernel and don't use modules, and then you need only a, a kernel and maybe a kernel config to be piped into the either the system console of the virtual machine or compiled into the kernel as config. Um, for the CI pipeline, that's probably good enough. For uh, a comfortable use case, you probably want a file system. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, unless uh, the boot room supports it, then everything should just boot and we uh, only have the last uh, paragraph of the commit message to worry about. Uh, part you, you um, mentioned conveniently that. Yeah. didn't copy and paste. Well, tell us more. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> So from my understanding, the 9P protocol uh, has uh, these file IDs, which are uh, per session, and are basically uh, handled to an open file descriptor in the server. And the problem is that the FreeBSD virtual file system layer doesn't ha have this stateful behavior. So it has to basically rediscover which file ID to use for which file open file so that because there's a mismatch between the way the virtual file system works and the 9P protocol works. And as the warning states, it uh, can happen that if a process does file opens and privilege drops in a certain order that it may not fully take effect, which is put which is a polite uh, kind of convoluted way, I think, of saying, yeah, potentially the whole file system access control is leaky and uh, nasal demons may emerge. Uh, yeah. But I assume that it's a lot easier to fix this um, before 15 uh, if the file system is already in. Uh, the tree because that means that you have one repository and the consumer of the VFS API changes um, is also in tree. So yeah, a lot easier to develop, I assume. Exactly. But this is re but touching the VFS is, um, yeah, it's, uh, let's say there are few people who should uh, do that if we want to improve system reliability and security. Amen. That's not something you can just tinker with mm -hmm. uh, and expect uh, to improve the system. Okay. So yeah. Uh, so this is something uh, which needs to follow up. Do you have a machine you can test this on in the next week before the next call? Probably because the host is already host site is already in 14, so on 13.2, I think, too, so in 13.3. Oh, that's a ridiculously simple good point. You just need a VM image from this path. Yes, here. you only need the, only the client has yeah. to be oh, current, duh. so okay, you so don't hallelujah. need your okay. host uh, to uh, run current. Uh, so wasn't it even in 12, 4? VM image should do it. Yeah. Uh, when was it? Um, it's been a few releases. You're right. Exactly. So, so it's not been, the server site has been in there for a while. Yes, it has. <laughs> I raised the money for that. Yes. Uh, uh, client. Yes. Okay. I don't awesome. Know how so hard it would be to backport the kernel module. Um... Uh, Hard to say. I did see an MFC of like three months or something for what it's worth. Okay. Uh, Jan, while you have the floor, do you want to talk about Vertio VSOC? 
So one of the annoying uh, parts of, for example, using NFS as root file system engine is not just NFS, but also that you have to configure the whole Ethernet and IP uh, interface. Mm -hmm. So you have to have a bridge interface. You have to worry about anyone you share even a virtualized layer to uh, network segment with spoofing or doing other little attacks, or you have to harden the hypervisor against them. And then you have to configure IP addresses. Okay, with link local IPv6, that's kind of auto-configured, but still it's a lot of stuff you have to do. And it's also a lot of overhead uh, for the hypervisor to emulate that all. And Vita or VSOC is basically a PCI device which does not emulate a network, but just sockets. So you have uh, standardized only datagram and stream sockets. And the host always has the well-known address zero. And then you have just basically guest IDs uh, larger than zero and uh, port numbers. So a uh, 64-bit address. Uh, and the hypervisor knows which, uh, because the client can't, is not allowed to spoof its source address, who is who, and uh, at least in Linux, there are patches so that you can run NFS on top of that, which is both faster than emulating an Ethernet and make and running TCP on top of that. And it's also easier to secure, and you can have well-known, basically, post ports on the host, to um, just uh, provide services and then basically every, anything which can work over a datagram or a stream socket uh, can work out of the box without configuration, which is kind of the last, uh, in theory at least, the last uh, bit.io driver you need because anything else can be built on top of either stream or uh, packet sockets. So yeah. Have you used it in real life? I played with it in Linux for a short while. It kind of worked, but support is not as universal as you would wish, which is if we ever get that, something where FreeBSD could shine because FreeBSD is an operating system, not just a kernel, which means we can build support into Netcard, um, INAD and so on, so basically anything which can be used most, uh, just works with one command line flag and for users. And yeah, and we could build it into uh, our NFS client and server. Mm -hmm. I've just it's probably some random links here. And it would, in my opinion, be very valuable for guest agents as well because it's uh, Faster and more flexible than using VetIO or console ports. In theory, this is supported on Linux. I didn't find uh, much uh, use cases of it documented. It looks like um, Red Hat was behind it and it kind of lost momentum, probably some reshuffling. <laughs> But the yeah. idea is sound. I would like to see oh, sequential okay. packet sockets too, but that's just my pet peeve. Should I leave that to the reader? Or do you want to tell us about that? That was sequential Sorry? packets. What about sequential packets? And um, that's just a pet peeve of mine, but they left that out. Hmm. Ah. But you know what? Cool. Uh, and I see. Google, Google, I'll just put links here and you're welcome to grab them as you like. Uh, so moving on, Dan Langell noticed that uh, Yuri Chiro's BMD has configure, um, uh, configuration file support. Perhaps that is the John Baldwin signature format let's see no it's not it's not it okay. has its own uh, config file with 
yuck and uh, flex. So uh, it's fairly expressive. And we had a call um, with the developer mm -hmm. a while ago. True, but that was a while ago, and this is last week. Let's see. Uh, ba, 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 yeah, uh, so he added a... memory. Yep. Go ahead. He added a few more features. This is basically an opinionated uh, demon to supervise uh, beehive processes. Um, the advantage is that because it kind of adds um, models on top of it, Mm. Um, how things should be if it can provide same default behaviors and but the problem is that um, for example the, the um, state change hooks are only run asynchronously in response to state changes not uh, in a blocking way so you can't use it to extend it for that you have to use the harder to use but at least existing um, plugin uh, API to write your own plugin in C. I see. Or some language with C FFI. Cool. Um, I'd love to see a demo of that and Chris's VM state D at some point, but today's probably not that day. No. Nope. Cool. Anything else, Jan, or shall we segue to what Andrew has been seeing in his lockups? Feel free to uh, cool. segue to. Okay, let the segueing begin. So, Andrew, you brought this up uh, the other day. Andreneg had yeah. seen it, but it's this, uh-oh, CPU locking. But you had a moment to research further. What did you learn? Well, um, the initial link I had had somebody getting a CPU lockup based on the... Um, the VM running out of entropy. And so it was waiting on the CPU as an entropy source because that's all the VM has. And so their solution was to use the VertIO RNG device, which adds a, an entropy source that is, it comes from the host and it just treats it as a, as a, PC, as a virtualized PCI device. Um, <clears throat> And so in the zone config format that, that we use on um, for um, Beehive branded zones, the equivalent stanza I, I listed in there. Yeah, I see that. Um, I don't know what it would be for any for the uh, for, for the um, FreeBSD mm. guys, but basically what it's doing is it's creating that uh, VertIO device. And um, using that now, I tested it on my personal uh, machine, and an instance of BSD picked up the device and decided to use it that it could use it as a randomness source. So it works insofar as that does, but I haven't tested it yet in the actual machines I was having a problem with. Um, I'm supposed to have a meeting tomorrow where we can hopefully get it turned on on those machines and see if it resolves the issue. But what, yeah, well, but what we're thinking is, or at least my thought, what I'm thinking is, is what's happening is, you know, it's requesting from the processor more entropy. And so the processor hangs waiting to try to, to provide that even though there's essentially nothing going on. Interesting. So what do you mean by the uh, processor? Do you mean the read random instruction, which then VM exits because it traps? Or uh, how is the processor supposed to uh, reseed the randomness pool? It's supposed, it, it's supposed to be reseeding the randomness pool using the processor as a randomness source. But, but drain, but I, I think in this case is what's going on is it's draining the randomness pool faster than it's the, the processor is able to produce new randomness. So normally, unless it has a dedicated hardware random number generator, so I would hope at least that a CPU is deterministic and so can't gen directly generate randomness. 
Um, there are. That's why I'm wondering what is the semantic definition of the CPU as randomness? Just like timer interrupts uh, when it context switches, it reads the rest of the I don't know the rest of the scheduler slice and then feeds that into the randomness pool or the uh, dedicated read random instruction like well, on implanting <clears throat> DCPUs uh, from the last decade. You're, you're, you're hitting on the problem, I think. The problem is the CPU is an awful source of randomness, so it's having trouble generating it. No, it's not. Uh, on a modern uh, x68 system, you have a dedicated instruction and a hardware random number generator. But you because do, that but that's not, piece is that's not being exposed really, at least not well, to the VM. Well, if the guest CPU reports as supporting that instruction, the guest kernel is allowed to use it. Hmm. And then uh, the question is, what does the hypervisor do? Does it just allow the guest state to directly access that instruction, thereby potentially draining the hardware randomness pool of the host? Or does it VM exit, so it traps, and then uh, emulate that instruction? And maybe that emulation blocks on the host random number generator. I don't I know. That's why I'm asking. In a D message, is that what we're talking about? No. Or something else. Yeah, into secure key RNG is the hardware random generator. Um, okay. And that RD is a power virtualized driver basically passing through the host's dev u random. And does that need to be mapped in the VM in some way, or does it get generally found host? Most uh, operating systems, including Linux and previously OpenBSD and so on, should all have uh, support for that built in. OK. Uh, it should pass through the host dev random, not dev u random. Oh. I think there's a flag, but yes. OK. I think you can ask for strong pseudo random or uh, true randomness. So, but yeah, you're right. So, uh, can you speculate when, under what other situations, a VM might be hungry for entropy and show surprise issues? Because I've not come across this in my mere decade. <clears throat> the yeah. the original document had it had um, Linux VMs when he was in, uh, when he was installing. Um, uh, some other specific applications. I think he had. Uh... Oh, I mean, VM. Sorry, okay. Could it be that the uh, guest uh, was trying to generate uh, GitLab. private oh, keys? GitLab. Okay. It could yeah, be that. So that wants to generate several private keys or something, and insists on using true randomness, not pseudo randomness. That would then drain the guest uh, random entropy pool, at least uh, how Linux accounts this, and then it would block. Yeah. So who knows? Yeah. Uh, yes, I'll let you type that in. Yeah, Patrick and Victor, if you can think of posts that might reflect that. That would be helpful. Let's see. Yeah, um, two, 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 two ideas and questions we yeah. had over the years, last two or three years, multiple reports that we never be, were able to resolve about people's Linux VMs freezing in trueness for no reason. And the uh, error message look, well, if they had configured serial console and actually saw any message, this soft lock off CPU stack looks suspiciously similar to what I remember, I think. 
Well, a search of because true NAS VM frees I've up always been problem. arguing that you could use BIV in production and that TrueNAS was super and stable and everything. Uh, I was never able to reproduce that, and I run quite a lot of Linux VMs. So would that depend on the type of CPU? Ooh, it could depend. It could depend on the type of CPU yes. based on what on, on what CPU features you've got. Um, it could also depend on what your workload looks like. If your workload has a lot of calling for randomness, it's going to drain the pool faster. And if you have an old CPU, uh, like a lot of people have, then uh, especially on the storage system, if they run a little home file server or something like that, uh, they probably aren't buying the latest hardware for it and over the years. So as you described, it would have been very likely that those CPUs did not have a hardware random number generator. Oh, which okay. means that it's more likely that basically they run out of entropy, uh, which is not because um, the guest or the host is unable to generate strong cryptographic pseudorandom material which is suitable for keys, but because some application said that I need true entropy, and then the kernel being very pessimistic about the quality of its entropy sources, just for safety reasons, and then considering itself out of entropy and itself for being allowed to fall back to cryptographic pseudorandom numbers, it blocks waiting for uh, enough strong uh, true randomness. So, yeah. Patrick, do you recall what Linux VMs or applications might have given you trouble and you just moved on? I I don't have trouble with Linux Never. applications. And maybe um, it's your CPUs and what CPUs uh, Yeah, I've, I've, I've only run server CPUs, older models, but at least Xeon D or... Uh, Atom by Intel in, in a super micro boards with ECC and everything. So they should have a pretty uh, powerful command set with all features included. I can check. And uh, the the other systems are more or less current AMD something something. So definitely no consumer CPU anywhere, no desktop system running true NAS and Beehive. Possibly that's that's the solution to the problem. But if, so, if, um, add, if adding the vert IO random number generator uh, helps with this issue, then we should just tell IX systems to please add it to the invocation of the Beehive VM unconditionally. I mean, it, it never hurts, does it? It shouldn't because it's a trivial driver. Uh, I just looked it up. Uh, the instruction was introduced on Intel with Broadwell. And uh, on AMD with Zen, I don't know about the Atom lineup, but yeah. Interesting. So if you run on yeah. Haswell or pre-Zen AMD, then you don't have access to that instruction. Yeah. Oh, I and wonder how it would my, be. My, Atom, my Atom 3000 series and my Xeon D both have it. Yep, okay. Xeon D should be at least Broadwell, which is exactly the UARC uh, I mentioned. And uh, yeah, so the Atom, problem is Atom potentially. This... Then, uh, does, does have it too. Okay. Is, is there a two or so three letter has feature an flag C2000 in the CPU? Which hasn't yet burned out its clock pin. Uh... <laughs> Is there a, a feature to look for? Uh, yep. Uh, the flag is, I think, something like RAND. Uh, yes, RAND or something. And it's potentially, I think, gated by the bias, but normally an by default. And yeah. Uh, but it only me is the source for the tr true host operating system to access uh, enough entropy to keep. It's def random uh, seeded. So, um, yeah. 
If, uh, it sounds like the fix is to just uh, have the, the, a, a random device so that uh, the guest thinks it has access to entropy and uh, is happy. Is that fully scalable so that if say 100 VMs request that entropy, it's it's unique universally or do they all get the exact same answer and you have a new problem? If that happens, you have a bad uh, bug <laughs> in the driver. Yeah, okay. Cool. And rest, it should drain the host cool. entropy pool and then block. Ah, I, I deal with stupid problems all the time, such that I never <laughs> rule out the possibility of a stupid problem like that. Okay, so of course you shouldn't. That's computing for you. Okay. Other topics. Uh, before I segue completely off topic. Oh, here we go. Wikipedia. <laughs> Thank you, Jan. Great find. Uh, I'll copy link. Boom. Although you are free to drop it in the doc. And does that link kindly give a list of actual model names? Or let's see. Do, 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 clicky clicky. It specifies uh, that Broadwell oh, or nice. them. Okay. It's not authoritative because it's only Wikipedia, of course, but hey. Hey, okay. cool. Uh, that is fascinating insofar as, you know, lots of freezes that people probably thought were related to running out of RAM might have, in fact, had nothing to do with running out of RAM. Yep. So let's spend a month crawling the forums and finding every possible issue that's ever happened in history. So... Um, off topic, there have been talks at EuroBSDCon and BSDCan about NSH, which is a Cisco slash Viata slash other like shell for OpenBSD. And uh, I should actually have a link to that, my bad. Um, I will dig that up. But uh, in a few conversations that took place during BSDCan, the author of NSH for other operating systems, uh, said, hey, I have it, yes, and it's out of date, and it's on uh, NSH 1.0, and then he updated it. So let me first get NSH here. Uh, NBSD NSH, and if you do not care, then I'm happy to stop talking about this, but quite a few of us are interested in this project. So let me, let me, Drop it in there. I'll call it NSHP for portable, like SSH, D, SSH, D, and client portable. Boom. And here we go. And for those who are thinking, you know, gosh, the, the TrueNAS Corral command line was kind of interesting. And oh, it's nice that there are various command lines, but there are just so many to choose from. Well, here is one that so far handles only like ping and such on the on portable operating systems. Ah, this has been updated. Great. Now, uh, example. Is that not linked? No, it's linked. Okay. Home basic net configuration. Okay. So you hop into a shell and you start banging commands in it, yawn like we did in in Mikrotik the other day. So the fact that that could be portable between a bunch of OSs, be it Mac OS, Linux, and FreeBSD is somewhat interesting. I probably have a link open here. If they have to emulate Cisco style. Is it Cisco style? I didn't even, you know. I'm... Looks a bit like it. Well, no one's been fired for using Cisco, right? <laughs> so, or yeah, fired for Cisco. Yeah. Sure if we, if you wake me up in the middle of the night and uh, after one beer too many in Dublin, I will probably be able to reproduce perfectly uh, the valid uh, iOS configuration. There you go. <laughs> you poor thing, you poor thing. I think there's a recovery group in your neighborhood. Yeah. I have, um, on the other hand, been fired for going yeah, over budget. At, at the bottom yeah. of the uh, table, 
in the pop. <laughs> <laughs> so, NetBSD, uh, this is what stands out for me. So uh, you are welcome to explore this at your leisure, but uh, his comment was, oops, we are still deep, deep, deep in tabs. Um, so far, ping, traceroute, and who work across the platforms, but that's just to show the framework of a tool that, oh, I buried the lead. Uh, Stefan Sperling's been working on NSH to get it open BSD base friendly and uh, slightly possible for inclusion, even though that's not necessarily a goal, but they do want it of that quality. So this code is getting love and heating up. Uh, would that potentially look like a interface to a virtual machine manager? I don't know. I'll leave that to the reader at this point, but uh, that is happening and heck, it might need some fundraising. So that is something, oops, if on it, I think uh, that's a if config. So other topics, questions, ideas, questions. Yeah, one one question. What I mean, you got? Before, before we, we stop the recording and uh, chat a bit, if you've got the time about the, the elephant, which is always the same elephant when we meet to talk about yeah. beehive. Um, there's There's been some things happening in the political sphere of, of Trunas in the last two or three weeks while I was on vacation. I don't oh, know if you picked tell. up. I have not been you. following I, mean, I will tell, but oh. I, I have a technical topic, and that's what I brought why I brought Please. Victor in. Um, yes. We have this problem that in VNC connections with the web VNC as well as with any client, um, the screen is not refreshing. So you have a display of your Windows login screen, but but nothing ever happens. You can even send commands somehow, press enter, then you refresh by reloading your browser window or refreshing your VNC client, and then it tells you, okay, wrong password, but try again, something like that but you just cannot work with a VM over VNC at all. And this applies to Windows as well as Linux guests. So there must be something broken with the VNC. Ah, okay. And IX systems claim that, that they are just using stock FreeBSD Beehive and have no intention in modifying anything about that. And my, my question to the regulars here is, is the, the process, the, the PS output, unfortunately, Beehive changes its command line. So I have no clue which parameters and which config they are using to start the VM. And I would like to find out what they are doing and try to reproduce the problem on stock FreeBSD 13.3 so we can have an issue and, and nail that. Try dwatch-xxve before you start the guest. Yeah, that's, they do. that's what I, that's what I tried, but for some reason it didn't work. I'll try again. So that's D watch. Yeah, right. I'll try again. Yeah, Apart that is a that, ridiculously it, useful syntax in that it shows simply what the machine is doing. And I mean, you could yeah. even do it during a build world or something insane. But Patrick, are you seeing this on it's stock FreeBSD or noisy. only in? It's going to be extremely noisy. Uh, as so as it, far as we know, currently it's on TrueNAS because I don't run BSD. So it's on TrueNAS 13.3 beta, which to my knowledge uses FreeBSD 13.3 Beehive unmodified. Okay. Seen on TrueNAS 13.3. Interesting. And as I told you in the email, I system said, oh, they will happily incorporate fixes that we deliver, but they are not going to debug this hmm. because it's it's an unsupported subsystem and always has been anyway. I can't wait for the day they proclaim ZFS an unsupported subsystem. <laughs> <laughs> so just for my NFS nice slow clarity. Or You've only seen this in TrueNAS, not in stock FreeBSD, or have you not had a chance to test stock FreeBSD? I did not have a chance to test because I don't know how I should set up Beehive. I've never worked with Beehive on plain FreeBSD, Michael, honestly. Goodness. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> uh, we need a hackathon. Anyway, other yeah. 
topics, questions, issues, funny jokes, t-shirt ideas. Not that I've ever made t-shirts beyond the BSD can ones. And a few Latvian inquire ones. Hans, do you have any uh, anything to share regarding your proposal before it goes to discrete discussions with uh, possible sponsors? <laughs> a non-trivial proposal such that uh, we want to get lots of feedback before we dive in. Non-trivial proposal. <laughs> yeah. You like that non-trivial? Um, yeah. Well, well, I saw the time can't work that is open. But that, as far as I understand, is also something that would mostly benefit uh, Windows guests. So if that is no longer of that much interest. Um, it is. Uh, is that a smaller project, if you will? Well, smaller than the one that we were talking about already. Yeah. And did Why you look at Vitaly's code? Because I recall it seeming to work, but blowing up on AMD. Yeah, uh, I looked at it, but that was like almost two years ago. But yeah. Okay. So the, the whole, whole thing in itself wasn't all that complicated. I mm -hmm. would, as, as um, from the coding point of view, but I can, could figure that it's um, interesting to test it, to actually verify that it is doing what it is supposed to be doing and that it is actually um, working correctly. Okay. And um, not messing time. I'll guess. try to see if his patch still applies. That might be a good start. Uh, definitely something I can look look at if there is uh, interest in that. Uh, I, I would say there is. And even I recall uh, Andrew's employer being somewhat interested. Well, if you if you want, um, I can try to write a statement of work for that. <laughs> uh, go for it. No, I I I'm I, I'm so glad you finally freed up to have this discussion. We've been yeah, dabbling no, with not... it for like two years. <laughs> <laughs> because um, yeah, it would be nice to have something useful to do that actually gets paid. <laughs> Amen. Okay, they're both valuable and yeah, as as Patrick pointed out, one of the key use cases is simply Windows stuff. And I'm now running that 24-7 with a client with surprises like, oh, can I have an, a short path to a, a BIOS booted system? For what it's worth, uh, Andrew, you might have some insights and I know uh, Mr. Gilbert might. So I know you can run the Microsoft MBR2 GPT utility, which changes the disk layout, but I'm still yeah. not convinced what tool is actually doing a creation and population of, of a UEFI uh, partition. I have the AOMI tools. They claim to do it, but it didn't work. I've seen a few blog posts that sort of claim to do it, but most of them say, hey, just wipe out all your data. It's like, that's not quite what I was after. <laughs> Uh, did, do you have any placing, there? Did, did you try placing refined on the EFI partition? Ah, uh, well, and that's the thing. I don't think it's creating a chain load Windows. Uh, Windows. I'm not convinced it blessed it as a as a UEFI partition. It just kind of did its thing and did the partition layout, but it did the partition type change, but not an actual layout change in any way. Uh, Windows 7 VM. I like that idea. Try refine. Or EFI MD. Unfortunately, he's not here. I think Mark oh. has more insights into that. Yes. Uh, and this is kind of cryptic, but Mark. Mark. Okay, cool. So uh, I only bring that up because it's fresh in my head and I pounded my poor head against it and, and got somewhere and I explored that. But uh, this is the kind of thing where I bet there's an organization out there who has massive amounts of Windows 7 on VMware and they need a home for it. And well, maybe we can be that home. Other topics, questions, ideas, concerns, funny jokes. Victor, is this in any way what you are expecting? Uh, <clears throat> pretty much. Cool. Um, For Windows, I can just recommend that you just set up RDP and use the built-in RDP server instead of a VNC uh, because it's a lot higher fidelity. 
of course, you need the VNC server to bootstrap it uh, unless you uh, want to uh, provision windows from the uh, serial port, which technically possible, but um, even yeah. few Windows operators know how to do it and it's not convenient and well documented. That's the rub. Usually you end up using the VNC just for the initial install at least. Correct. There are sometimes things you need to do early on, so it is nice to have that, you know, the wait command and then be right there at the start. But yes, in production, once things are set up, RDP is your friend. And I've thrown a whole bunch of uh, auto unattend XML bits in my Occam BSD repo, which lets you set up windows with, say, users and RDP and uh, no Windows 11 requirements, uh, TPM requirements and other fun stuff. So feel free to check that out. You are kindly throwing in. Mm -hmm. And guacamole. So show of hands, who's tried guacamole in action? Because I have this lovely vision for taking all these old machines and making them available through some convenient interface. And the interface would wake up the machine on demand or with a big old button you push. And well, off you um, go. the UDS guys use guacamole for their web interface. So if you're going to use the, the web access, that's guacamole. Ah. Um, in practice, I find it a little slow. Hmm. So I, I would much rather use a, a, a native RDP client. If you um, are connecting on a local network or in general. I use it over the internet to access virtual machines in my home lab, and I'm perfectly satisfied with it. And um, I, not only did I did I do the initial installation and hard coded plain text passwords in the config file, but whenever I try such a piece of software that uh, sparks my interest, I go for a full enterprise setup. So I have MySQL based user management, authentication, management of connections and everything. And it's all, everything just works splendidly and as fast as I can expect if you do it across the entire internet. Do you have a blog post or documentation doc you can share about that? <laughs> Not yet. Uh, can I send a beverage your way or anything or shame you or some whatever motivation you prefer? Because I would love to see that. Okay, let's see. I, I run it in a jail. It runs perfectly well on FreeBSD. No Linux dependencies anywhere. So I guess that could be done. Okay. And since I don't need to prepare a talk for Dublin this year, because the talk is already in the drawer, because it's a workshop. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you're doing a workshop or not? I'm doing a workshop. What's the, and the good thing about workshops is you prepare them once and then you can just pull them out for each repeated EuroBSD card. Uh, that's a topic that also came up this week. But what's the topic of your specific workshop? The, the vagrant again. Okay, okay, got it. So a uh, quick thing about uh, how did you phrase it? Pro pro providing the same tutorial for years on end. Uh, what is the statute of limitations on that and expiration date of giving the same tutorial over and over because as uh, a co BSD can planner or BSD can co planner I'm I'm curious what would revitalize the uh, tutorials to keep them exciting as opposed to wow we've seen that same one on the schedule for years on end yeah, sure. there I said it well they vagrant as a piece of technology might become obsolete because uh, developers who Develop desktop applications or web applications all move to to integrated Docker, DevD, something, ah. something, etc. So they're not spawning full features VMs. I use it because I do operating system work and develop our hosting platform in virtual machines on my Mac. But then again, for that very reason, I'm bound to to Intel architecture. So with Apple moving to their own silicon, let's see where that will will lead. So. My topic might become obsolete in on its own, okay, two or three. <laughs> cool. But just picture Kirk McCusick and his architecture talk. This that will never expire. Uh, architecture, no. Uh, PF maybe it's evolved into BGP. I'm glad to see that. Uh, so Andrew, it sounds like Mark might want to talk vagrant with Patrick at some point if you 
want to. I can see that conversation happening. Cool. So I would say, other than B your BSD can uh, moving around um, so that you, you kind of always have a fresh local audience, the most important part is staying relevant for a tutorial. So yes. if the target That's technology question. doesn't change, the tutorial may still be useful if you have a new audience because you moved half a continent uh, since last year <laughs> with your conference, whereas BSD can is uh, in the same town every year. So and draws the a more constant uh, audience or more because of that. So um, but the tutorial has to change more because uh, you have less uh, fluctuation. Mm -hmm. All true. So, yeah. And the other um, point is if the uh, program committee has uh, lots of good tutorials to pick from, they will probably rotate through them so that you don't get a tutorial slot with an unmodified uh, tutorial every year, but only every couple of years. Hans, do you think you can make it to EuroBSDCon in Dublin? Is there a high-speed rail underwater or something crazy? Out west, we don't know what trains are. Not a clue. I'm mm -hmm. afraid I I need to step out. Okay. I've got a, another meeting I got to go to. Understood. Okay, gang. Well, when again is that? That is September 19th through 22nd. Um, you have a few more days for early birds booking. I, I don't I don't think I'll be able to, to get there at that time frame because a week later I'm getting married. <laughs> oh, congratulations. Yeah, I, I guess she would, she would love That's to go to more Dub important. Do it in Dublin. I have a birthday the day after so there's that so you know okay everyone anything else or shall we call the call it quits on the official call okay well thank you and like and subscribe someone pointed out that that should be much earlier such that people actually hear it as opposed to the marathoners who reach the end of the call but i wish you a great remainder of the week and weekend bye but